Hello and welcome to Japan Expert Insights and our Business Insights Forum. Every Thursday, Tim Sullivan and I, Maya Matsuoka, lead a discussion looking for insights, developments, and new opportunities for the business in Japan. In this podcast, we welcome comments, questions, and opinions. So if you haven't done so yet, join us next time. In the meantime, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the discussions on Japanese politics, business insights, and the Japan's role in the Indo-Pacific region. Oh, good morning, and thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, we have uh, Ren Nagawa today. We have, uh, have we have had him before twice. He's one of our favorite guest speakers, and I'm sure that uh, if you follow uh, these rooms, you have listened to some of his um, conversations with us as well. So today we're going to talk about Japan and Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia. So Ren is his resident of Philadelphia, and um, you, I'm sure that you all of you know that he loves art and history. So uh, today we're going to hear a lot about uh, the relations between uh, uh, the city of Philadelphia and Japan from him. Ren, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maya. Thank you, Timothy, um, uh, for offering the opportunity to uh, to talk about this, uh, uh, this great, uh, one of the great cities in the world. Um, and, and thank you for the audience uh, uh, for coming coming to this room uh, to to enjoy uh, some of the the, the, the wonderful th things that this, this city has to offer and the interesting connections with Japan, um, some of which are not well known and uh, and pretty fascinating. Uh, I have lived in this city for almost thirty years, and. Uh, I was um, for some of the, some of my friends who may not know my background. I was actually born in Taiwan, Taipei in Taiwan, and I came back to Japan when I was uh, ten years old, and I came to the U.S. Um, so I had this. Uh, I have had this uh, uh, the Asian view of this city, Philadelphia. Um, so maybe I can offer some of the uh, um, new new views uh, if you already know this city as well, and. And also want to mention um, that uh, uh, Philadelphia uh, uh, is uh, selected uh, by um, UNESCO, uh, United Nations World Heritage Cities uh, Committee, which is headquartered in Montreal, Canada. Um, and they selected uh, Kyoto and Nara as the World Heritage Cities in Japan. Uh, there are two cities in Japan, by the way. Uh, the war heritage cities means that the entire city is a war heritage site because the city itself has so many things to offer. And the first city that was selected in the U.S. was Philadelphia, and there are only two in America. The other city is surprise, surprise, uh, San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, with that, um, I want to also say that uh, Philadelphia uh, is introduced in many tour books in Japan as. Kyoto of America. Well, I think a lot of Philadelphians would say Kyoto is the Philadelphia of Japan, but um, in either case, um, I think Kyoto and Philadelphia have a lot, a lot of similarities, weather-wise as well. Um, and as, and from distance point of view, uh, I, I think uh, if you call New York as uh, Tokyo, I think Philadelphia is a little bit like Yokohama. Um, and so, you know, Yokohama is next to a big brother, and Philadelphia is next to a big brother called New York. But, uh, but I think that that is, uh, that is also not an unfair comparison uh, between uh, Kyo, uh, Philadelphia and Yokohama in terms of the distance to the, the big brother. Philadelphia right now is the, uh, I think it's the sixth largest city in the US in terms of population. The, the, uh, the, the biggest one is New York, um, followed by, I think, Los Angeles, and then Chicago, and then uh, Houston. And it used to be Philadelphia the fourth one, but uh, Houston is the fourth one. And then the fifth one is Phoenix, Arizona, and then Philadelphia. The reason Houston and, and Phoenix uh, went up so high so quickly is because, because a lot of people are moving out of Silicon Valley um, and also the oil business in Houston area, and a lot of Asian uh, people coming to Houston. Um, so Philadelphia is now the sixth largest city in the US. So it is still bigger than San Francisco, Atlanta, uh, and uh, Seattle. So it is a big city. 
but again, because it's hidden inside uh, next to uh, next to uh, New York, so it's not that obvious. Um, and there are many advantages of being a, a younger or, or smaller brother uh, next to a big brother. And I'll get into that a little bit later. And also, uh, I think uh, uh, Philadelphia is um, uh, how should I say is in the interesting location, and because right next to it, north is New York, about an hour and a half drive. And below Philadelphia, in the, to, the, to the south, about uh, three hours drive, is Washington, D.C. And if you think about New York, New York is a financial center, right? And then the Washington, D.C. is political center. Um, you can have the world with uh, just finan finance and politics. You gotta have somebody who actually produce some goods, right? And that's what Philadelphia has been playing the role. Uh, and, and Philadelphia has been uh, the a center of uh, innovation in the early 20th century. Uh, uh, some people may remember a brand name called RCA that, that invented the television and record. Um, and Philadelphia today is still considered the, the video valley instead of Silicon Valley, because video valley, because, because of the R RCA legacy and uh, Comcast. The world's largest uh, cable TV company is still headquartered in Philadelphia, and, and Comcast also owns Universal uh, Studio and, and NBC, as you know. So there's still a lot of video-related technologies going on in Philadelphia area. So um, I think I covered very basic things before I get into the juicy part of the history of this city. But if any uh, questions you'd like to jump in, Maya or Timothy or anyone on the an audience who would like to uh, join, join me on the stage. Thank you for this. I think that it's important to, uh, well, present where uh, the city is located and, it, well, why it is important uh, and what companies and, of course, uh, what kind of uh, hub it, it is. Because uh, from there, we will go to uh, into the culture of uh, exciting uh, things, as you said. So thank you very much for this. <laughs> thank you. And, and I forgot to mention one thing about the basic, in the basic yeah. things. It's called... Um, Philadelphia is the biggest city in the uh, state of Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania is called Keystone State. Uh, Keystone in, uh, in Japanese, I think it means uh, Huseki. It's an important stone to host, to, to, to stand up for something, right? Um, it's called Keystone because Philadelphia is the, the, the station, the, the Amtrak train station, uh, where uh, the important junction happens. So. One of the most important railroad is from uh, New England, Boston, all the way to Miami, right? Al along the Atlantic coastline. And then you have a, a railroad coming from the coast into in inland to Chicago. And that junction happens at Philadelphia and it's called Keystone Junction. So Philadelphia play a very important role to propel this country uh, into the 20th century or 19th or 20th century uh, industrialization. Mm -hmm. And it also has the largest um, uh, uh, clear water port in the world. Um, it's a, it is a river. Uh, so, so you can see it's a, it's a natural selection. And of course, the, uh, the place where United States declared independence from the, the British. Um, so, and the connections to Japan that we are going to get into. Okay, so with that, I posted um, a link. Um, I, I pinned a link on this on the, on this room, and I'm going to talk a lot of things. Hopefully, the topics will be uh, of your interest, um, and you can follow that link that I posted there. Um, and uh, and hopefully, uh, we can finish this in an hour. I hope, Maya. Uh, <laughs> so so let me get into uh, some of the important buildings in in the city of Philadelphia. Um, I think I'll pick City Hall as the first one. If you click the map location, you can actually see the Google map. So you may want to <laughs> bookmark this page if you want to visit Philadelphia someday. You can have a, this could be a nice uh, touring guide for you. Uh, the, the City Hall, this City Hall is amazing. It is the world's largest freestanding uh, masonry building. Um, it is opened in 1904. Uh, it was the world's largest, tallest uh, building at that time. Um, he appeared in many movies, Rocky, National Treasure, The Transformer, Transformers, uh, The Revenge of Fallen, and of course the movie uh, Tom Hanks, Philadelphia itself. And, um, and also, 
and maybe this is a good time to talk a little bit about the history, uh, there's a person sitting on top of that building, standing on top of that building, he's called William Penn, and uh, it is the tallest, it is the, it is a statue on top of a building that is standing at the highest or, or the tallest location and also it's the biggest <laughs> uh, statue in the world. And so let's, let's talk a little bit about who he is and, and because he has a lot of connections to Japan. Uh, like I said, his name is William Penn and uh, he came from UK, uh, England to Philadelphia and he is a person who built uh, the city in 1682. And um, the reason he came to Philadelphia is, it, the story is kind of interesting. Um, he believed in, uh, 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 believe in he, he was a Quaker and and I think a lot of Japanese friends know that the Puritans went to Boston because they were prosecuted in the UK. And then the, um, but Quakers were also prosecuted in the UK, so they came to Philadelphia. Um, but there's a difference. The, the Puritans, they went to Boston, but once they arrived in Boston, they built the city of Boston. They were not very tolerating to other religions. Uh, some of them even uh, started prosecuting other people who are not Puritans in Boston. Mm -hmm. But uh, what William Penn did was completely different. He came to Philadelphia and he declared that this city is going to be um, uh, protecting religious freedom. In other words, William Penn is the real father of the American American virtue, if you will. And so he, he uh, uh, and the reason he came to Philadelphia is because his father, uh, left him a land, a huge land in, in, in Pennsylvania. The reason his father had that much land is because the king in UK at that time, in England at that time, uh, he liked to spend money uh, on the luxury stuff and his father, William Penn's father, was rich. So the, the king borrowed a lot of money from William Penn's father and eventually the king couldn't pay back. So he gave William Penn's father this land near Philadelphia or Pennsylvania. Mm. Um, so William Penn inherited that land and when he believed in Quakers and when Quakers were prosecuted, he took everyone, I mean, he took his friends to, to Philadelphia and built the city in, eight, in 1682 with a very, very clearly, uh, a very clear city plan. So in Philadelphia, you can drive a car. It, it's, it's basically up and down, left and right. And then, um, but in Boston, New York or Washington DC, I would not recommend driving a car in the city. So, uh, William Penn came to, came to Philadelphia and he built this city in 1682 and in the land, uh, they wanted to call it Pen Pencil uh, Pennsylvania, Penn's land, but, Penn's, but William Penn says, no, no, that's too obvious. So they changed it to Penn's forest. Forest means Sylvania. So that's why Pennsylvania, the name, is really uh, how, he, how he ended up. And then he basically, uh, as soon as he came to Philadelphia, he tried to, 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 to uh, follow his dream of the real democracy. And he created this uh, something called frame of the government of Pennsylvania, uh, which is upper house, lower house. And, and that became the constitutional design of the Senate in 1787, which really became the, uh, the constitution of this, this country. So it is interesting if you follow William Penn's uh, footsteps, Google it a little bit, um, and uh, that's how this uh, country was, was based on. He wanted to have a community with religious toleration and a great deal of political freedom. Um, so I'm kind of proud of living in the city that he built or designed, and, uh, um, and he's standing on top of that city hall. And if you watch the movie Rocky, uh, the first one in, in 1982, I believe, you will see that there was no other building that was built taller than his hut because there was a gentleman's agreement in the city that you shouldn't do that. Uh, but after the Rocky II, Rocky III, you're gonna see some buildings taller than his hut and that's when we uh, Philadelphians call ourselves, we are getting into uh, some kind of a curse because of William Penn's curse. We couldn't win a, 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 a champion of any of the four major sports, uh, but only uh, a few years ago, uh, Philadelphia was able to have a, a World Cup, uh, uh, the, the World Series, um, only a few years ago and also Super Bowl champion. Um, but I guess that was only a few years ago. So the, the William Penn's curse still remains for the ice hockey and also the basketball. Uh, any questions on the city hall, William Penn? Um, the others will be much quicker. <laughs> so this is a fascinating story. Thank you for telling us uh, about William Penn. So, okay. Yes. Let's continue then.
Okay. Um, and then the next one I would like to talk about is Barnes Collection. This is something that I would really, really recommend my friends to visit when they come to Philadelphia, and I'll take them there always. Um, it is amazing. It is simply amazing. It's a, it's a, it's a guy, uh, well, Dr. Barnes. He was a, he invented a medicine and he became rich and he went to France mostly, and he was able to discover some of these painters when they were not so famous. He was able to treat them with nice dinner and then get the painting, which is unbelievable because these paintings are millions of dollars today. So he has Renoir 180, 180 Renoir, and he has Cezanne 70. And by the way, 70 Cezannes is more than all of the Cezanne painting in the entire city of Paris. And Matisse, uh, 60 items and more, more than that. This is just amazing. And the, in, in 2013, the total estimate of, the, of his, his collection uh, in his uh, art gallery is worth over 25 billion US dollars, which I think in uh, 2021 right now, it's probably a doubling that. So, so you have a $50 billion art collections in, this, in the city of Philadelphia. Um, I really suggest you, uh, well, I would not suggest, it's, not more, it's more than a suggestion. You have to make a reservation because they do control, uh, population control, not because of COVID, uh, because they want to maintain a quiet environment for people to visit. It's not a museum of art, if you will. It's more like education um, institution. And, and that's what, uh, what Dr. Barnes wished for when he died. And that's why a lot of people wanted to uh, take control of these uh, magnificent uh, collections of arts. And that's why there's a controversy about this. And it's considered the greatest controversy of the art world. And it became a movie. And uh, I, I put the link there uh, if you would like to take a look at it as well. And so if you watch the movie and it came to Philly and then go to Barnes Collection, that you, you probably can enjoy even twice more. Um, the interesting things about Barnes Collection with Japan is that Japan, uh, I think in Ueno, the Tokyo National Western Art Museum, I think that's what it's called. Uh, they had this special exhibition of Barnes Collection that was in 1994. More than one million, one million visitors came, and that is the largest record number of visitors of an art exhibition in Japan, and that record is still not broken today. Yeah. Um, according to the report, which I posted the link, uh, it's a Japanese uh, article, the waiting line was as long as 12 kilometers not 1.2 kilometers, but 12 kilometers, adding all the lines together. Um, and the waiting time was as long as five hours. And some people fainted uh, because they couldn't stand so long and their blood pressure went down, I think. So they, there were actually seven ambulances uh, that came to rescue them. So it was a huge sensation. And it, but if you come to Philadelphia, make a reservation, as I, made, as I suggested, as I uh, asked, uh, you don't have to wait for, for, for that long. Um, so that's Barnes Collection. Um, any uh, any suggestion, questions, uh, comment, Timothy, Maya? Well, there are a lot of things I'm just learning now from you, Ren. So, um, hmm. I, I guess I, I need a few minutes, you know, to put everything into my head and, and, and make them. Yeah, yeah okay. you're, you're, you're so thorough and organized. Yes. That I don't think I can add anything to what you've said. So please carry on. You know? Okay. <laughs> All right. So the, the third one I'd like to mention is Academy of Music. This is not an Academy of Music institution, but this is the oldest opera house in the U.S. Uh, I put the pictures there. You know, it doesn't look like a typical building in the U.S. You feel like you are in some kind of Europe, European cities. It was built in 1857. It is the oldest in the U.S., but it's older than some of the Austrian German opera houses, like Vienna Opera House is built, was built in 1869. Uh, the one, the Bavaria National State Opera in Munich was built in 1875. So. Well, of course, the Italian opera houses were built in, six, in 16 something or 17 something. So, uh, of course, those the opera houses are even older. But the, this, uh, to, to have an opera house, this all that is still functioning in the US, it, it's quite amazing. It is the home of the Opera Philadelphia um, and that, that I, I admire and support uh, um, very much. And, and uh, it, it was also a home of the, of the Philadelphia Orchestra until year 2000 before the Philadelphia Orchestra finally has a symphony hall for them. And this, um, um, well, I was told by some of my Hollywood friends that uh, sometimes, you know, when they don't have budget to fly to Europe, uh, they will come to the Academy of Music to film a scene that looks like a European uh, city. So, uh, I, well, there was a movie for that that's called The Age of Innocence. Uh, so, so I'm going to keep on going until uh, Timothy, uh, Maya, you interrupt me, okay? <laughs> yes. For the sake of that. All, right. All right, good. And then the next one I'd like to uh, introduce is Victor's Cafe. Um, so Philadelphia 
the South Philadelphia or South Philly, we call it, uh, is it's the largest Italian town, Italian, um, uh, yeah, Italian, Italian Jingai, uh, in Japan, Italian town in, oh, oh, uh, in the U.S. And of course, the, the, the most famous guy uh, from, that, from that part of the town is Rocky Balboa, the boxing guy, the, the, um, Sylvester Stallone. And, but there's a, a very charming restaurant I would like to recommend to my friends. Um, this is called Victor's Cafe. And the owner once worked for uh, RCA, uh, and you know, RCA has a fixed uh, brand name uh, with the white dog. Um, so that's why he called his cafe uh, Victor's Cafe. And um, by the way, speaking of RCA, um, uh, in 1952, uh, Sharp, the Japanese company Sharp, uh, Tokuji Hayakawa san, he came to RCA and cross licensed the television technologies. And so, uh, as I said, uh, Philadelphia is a video, it's called Video Ballet. So he came and then. Um, well, I, the first company I worked for was Panasonic, but then the next company I worked for was actually uh, RCA Laboratory, which became a licensing company. And so we have a picture of Mr. Uh, Hayakawa and uh, uh, RCA, uh, I think it was uh, David son of, or maybe his son, uh, should be his son, um, signing the, the ceremony. So this RCA Victor, and, and it's called Victor Cafe, and why it's so special, it's not just another Italian restaurant. The waiters and waitresses are opera students. So they will actually sing opera arias in, in the restaurant for you. And I put a, a YouTube video of how, how it looks like, and uh, it, will be a, it will be an experience. Um, and then uh, the movie Rocky also chose this uh, restaurant as, as Rocky's retired, uh, uh, Rocky you know, became a restaurant owner after he retired, and he chose this restaurant as his restaurant, and he called it uh, Adrian's restaurant, which was you know, his wife's name. So you, you actually see Adrian's restaurant, Adrian's, in the movie, at the sign where it usually says Victor's Cafe, um, so that's that's a restaurant I would, <laughs> I would recommend. And then, of course, uh, we have some Japanese American uh, communities, um, and uh, we have uh, we have the large Philadelphia has the largest uh, city park in the world. Uh, I think it's twice bigger than the Central Park of New York. Uh, I forgot the exact dimension, but it's called Fair Fairmount Park. And the Fairmount Park has a beautiful Japanese house called Shofu So. And uh, it's a little bit difficult to find, so I also put the Google Map location on this uh, uh, pin. And it is also where uh, Japan America Society of Greater Philadelphia uh, does a lot of uh, activities. And I'm a board member of that uh, association. And uh, one of the, uh, there are so many activities we are doing. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things we do is, I think, is a tea ceremony. And uh, um, I, sh I should mention that the Japan American Society is a little bit different from the typical Japan club because Japan club is mostly, you know, a lot of Japanese get together speaking Japanese and things like that. Um, and maybe even go to karaoke, right? Uh, Japan American Society, the majority of the people in the society are actually Americans. Uh, many different people with many different skin colors, if you will, or different race, different cultural background, whoever loves Japan, they come. And in fact, uh, 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 the majority of the board members are Americans. And Japan American Society also uh, does a lot of um, business and as well. So if you ever want to open your shop in Philadelphia, uh, a Japan American Society has a great business uh, division that help connecting a Japanese company to to, to, to do business in Philadelphia. And one of the longest Japanese company that has been present at the Philadelphia, there are two of them. One is Subaru. You know, you think Amer Jap uh, Japanese car company like Toyota, they are mostly in the Detroit area, but Subaru is in Philadelphia area. And also Tokyo Kaijo Kasai, the insurance company, acquire uh, uh, one of the most traditional uh, historic uh, insurance company in Philadelphia called Philadelphia Insurance Company. Uh, so their office is also in Philadelphia. And they were both uh, members of uh, Japan American Society. Uh, so that's uh, Shofu So, and it's it's beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, Japanese house with Japanese garden. Uh, it was built in eight, 1954, uh, not so uh, far after World War II to celebrate Japan-U.S. friendship. And then inside this uh, Fairmount Park, I have to mention this memorial hall. This is this is something I really like every uh, Japanese friends of mine to know this. Memorial Hall is the main hall of the 1876 Centennial Exhibition, or in Japanese we call it Manpaku, yeah, 
the first it's a, it's, it was the first official awards fair to be held in the U.S. It is where uh, Bell showed the telephone, and then apparently the Russian Russian Empire was shocked when he heard something on, on, on his ear. So there were many things that took place in 1876, uh, which is 100 years after the independence of the United States, 1776. So it is the major exhibition, the, the biggest ex exhibition at that time in the world. Um, so uh, at that time, at that time, when the Westerners uh, or Europeans think Asia, they only think about India and China. Not so many people knew Japan. So uh, Okubo Toshimichi, Toshimichi, for example, was the leader of this. Uh, he, he said, well, you know, maybe using culture is the best way to show to the world that, hey, Japan is here. And then so they used, uh, how much was that? Uh, I think five million US dollars in today's uh, dollar, dollar, dollar amount. And they planned to, for a Japan a pavilion five years before the exhibition took place. And they sent the best, the best of the best Japan had to offer from Yokohama to San Francisco and then, then through the, 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 the train from San Francisco to Philadelphia. And they, they sent the, uh, the Daikusan, you know, the, the builders, the build this uh, Japan pavilion. And they took away a lot of first prizes um, and really surprised many Westerners. And there was a, a, I forgot his name, but there was a famous a German scholar who came to Philadelphia. He didn't know Japan uh, had this uh, high level of craftsmanship. And he said, he said, oh, maybe in 20th century, Japan and Germany are going to compete each other. And he was right. Uh, so this really uh, opened up many Westerners' eyes about this island nation called Japan. And America actually went Japan crazy after this. Uh, I know a lot of Americans are crazy about Japanese manga, but uh, you know that's a different story. But in the 1876, uh, America started going to, to Japan to buy a lot of uh, Japanese um, craft, um, uh, craft arts and things like that imported uh, to, the, to the US and it made a lot of Japanese people rich as well. And, um, and, and I put the uh, Japan Pavilion's picture in this link as well. So if you're interested in, in seeing what picture it looked like. And now this, uh, uh, the, so all these pavilions are gone after the ex exposition, uh, but the, the main hall remains, which is now called Memorial Hall. So when you go there, uh, you know, please enjoy a little bit of, of this historic event that made Japan famous. On the, and put Japan on the center of the world's world map. Um, and that was 1876. And this uh, <laughs> memorial hall is now called, it, it's, a, it's becoming, a, a, it's now a, 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 ch a children museum. And then the name of the children museum is very interesting. It's called Please Touch Museum. Meaning you can come in, you can touch anything you want to because children are used to, uh, uh, t uh, you know, told not to touch this, not to touch that, but you know, please come here, you can touch anything. And it is, it is a, a very um, cute and beautiful. And historic museum for children to, to pray around. All right, so that's uh, um, uh, and the next one. I'm going to continue moving on. Uh, please interrupt me uh, if I if my voice is losing or whatever. All right, the next one is for the for the music lovers uh, is Wanamaker's pipe organ. So the world's largest pipe organ is actually inside the world's oldest department store uh, called Wanamaker uh, next to the city hall. And, and can you believe this? You can actually do shopping and listening to somebody play pipe organ as if you were in a church. <laughs> uh, and they performing, uh, they perform pipe organs every day, uh, I think at around noon and then around five o'clock, but the exact schedule is published and I put the link there on, 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 the, on the website as well. And the Japan connection here, uh, you know, Tokyo's uh, Mitsukoshi, uh, there was uh, there was a Jomu or Senmu, uh, you know, anyway, one of the senior executives came to, to Philly and he was like, wow, this is amazing. So he decided, he went back to, 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 to Japan or Tokyo and then he put, he, he did the same thing. Uh, of course, the pipe organ is much smaller um, in Mitsubishi's, uh, Tokyo's Mitsubishi's headquarters store, a uh, home tent. And some of them may have experienced that. Uh, but next time you go there, you listen to the pipe organ in Mitsubi Mitsukoshi. Um, and please think about its connection, historic connection with uh, Philadelphia's uh, Wanamaker's pipe organ. And because this uh, uh, department store is so historic and it's beautiful inside, it was used in the movie called uh, Mannequin. And, uh, and of course, the, the big hit was Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now, right? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if Timothy remember this song, but this is from that movie. This song was from that movie. I, I just had to mention that. I do recall it, yes. You do recall it. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Um, so speaking of music a little bit, um, I, I want to mention about uh, Philadelphia Sound. 
which is a unique uh, sound. It's a mix. It's where uh, maybe because of the Philadelphia tradition, you know, uh, we are very open. Uh, in all religions, were accepted the first city in human history that that allow all the religions, right? Uh, so, uh, so called the uh, for the lack of better world, uh, uh, for the lack of better world, uh, you know, the, the black people's music and the white people's music, they kind of separated before, and but they were they were together in Philadelphia, and that became Philadelphia sound. It, it's very it became very contemporary, um, and in 1981, uh, in 1980s, there was a group called Holland Oats. Uh, some of you may remember, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, this group, um, and they were from Temple University. Temple University is in Philadelphia, and one of the famous Japanese people who attended this university is a journalist called Ochiya Nobuhiko. He also was in, in Temple University. Uh, and Hoda Lodz um, was a very good, they were very good friends with uh, Kuwata Keisuke. So Kuwata Keisuke also came to Philadelphia, and according to Ho, Dario Ho, uh, they took Kuwata Keisuke to some of the uh, uh, shops or stores that may look scary, uh, but Kuwata, Kuwata Keisuke was not afraid of anything. He just followed wherever uh, Hall and Nose went to. Um, so, uh, next time you see Kuwata Keisuke, um, you think about Philadelphia Sound and Hall and Nose, and it's, these are all connected. Uh, all the musicians are, are all connected, whether it's in rock and roll or in classical music. Um, and then, um, the the most famous Japanese restaurant in the world for foreigners uh, is also in Philadelphia. Uh, Morimoto-san, the Iron Chef, uh, no uh, he is also, um, just like me, fell in love with the city. So he lives in the city and then the, the Morimoto restaurant uh, is in, in Philadelphia downtown. And of course he built, uh, he, he opened other Morimoto uh, satellite uh, restaurants around around the world, but the uh, home tent is in Philadelphia. And the interior is actually quite contemporary, and it was used in a movie called In Her Shoes. Uh, and I wouldn't say Morimoto is a Japanese restaurant, though. I think it's more like a fusion, uh, but it's tasty and a little bit pricey. Uh, but I think you can have a good time. And moving on, uh, near Philadelphia, there is a beautiful garden uh, called Longwood Garden, and it has a historic meaning as well, because um, as I mentioned, Philadelphia is uh, is where America became independent, and America had a lot of help from the French. And one of the great French persons who helped George Washington was the Dupont family. And um, this Longwood Garden, uh, arguably, I'm not an expert of the gardening, but I heard, um, and I went to this, uh, this uh, garden many times, and I agree with them that uh, they said that this is the most gorgeous and beautiful garden in the East Coast. And it is often compared with the Butchard Garden in the West, uh, uh, in, I think in Victoria, Canada. Um, this garden was, uh, was, was owned by, a, or the land was owned by a Quaker, um, but then it was later acquired by DuPont. So if you like to see what uh, an example of the rich, uh, wealthy Americans do, uh, does to the public, this is a good garden to go to, and it's beautiful, it's, it's really beautiful. The Christmas uh, decoration is absolutely gorgeous, um, and it's not too far from Philadelphia. So, uh, this is like a good middle break before I get into the juicy part of the, the deep history between Japan and Philadelphia. Um, anybody would like to come up, or uh, Maya, Timothy, uh, please. We've got Doug, um, um, yes, Okay. Good morning, Doug. Welcome. Hey, Doug. How are you doing? Ohayo gozaimasu. Thank Ohayo you. Ohayo gozaimasu. You're amazing. Really, just love your the conversation today. I I'm uh, I'm actually a New Yorker, and but I work for Dupont. So that oh. was my career. <laughs> and I when I moved to Japan as an expat, I went mm. to the Berlitz in Center City, Philadelphia. I took the train from Wilmington mm. up into to Penn Station and down into Center City, and, and uh, almost every day went to Berlitz and learned Japanese. So there's I have a lot of other connections <laughs> to, uh, okay. between uh, Japan and, and Philadelphia. But I wanted to uh, mention one thing that mm. is a little bit of a uh, something that I, I mean, I love Philadelphia. So I wanted to kind of bring this up. Mm. And that is Philadelphia has a little bit of a chip on its shoulder, you know, and, mm. and I think the Shofuso house example is a mm. really good one because that house for, that was built for the Centennial, I believe, was actually built in Nagoya for a Museum of Modern Art exhibit in New York. 
So right. it really wasn't built for Philadelphia. But that's right. it shows up in New York, and then I guess they don't want it, or something happens, and so right. Philadelphia is always the second city, right? It's always never New yeah. York, you know? And right. so I think Philadelphians have kind of an attitude of they're, they're never – they're kind of like never good enough. It's a little bit on the darker side. It's a rough yeah. city, you know, and I think if anybody wants to know a little bit more about kind of the attitude of Philadelphia, there's a, mm. a net Netflix show called Mayor of Easttown, which I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, there's a simple word for it. I think it's called underdog, right? It's underdog. It so it's underdog. Uh, underdog. What is the good word, a Japanese word for underdog? Uh, well, it's not market inu because it's not always a loser. It's just uh, underrated, if you will. Um, and it's a little bit like Yokohama, right? Um, it's, uh, Tokyo is so big, uh, but the benefit is tremendous. I mean, I can live in a city, <laughs> I, I can live in the house that is half price of, <laughs> of the house in New York, um, and, and still, uh, enjoy these, uh, these cultural activities. And, and to many, uh, to many classical musicians, they think Philadelphia Orchestra sounds better than New York Philharmonic. In fact, the Carnegie Hall consider Philadelphia is the most most connected uh, relation city, uh, uh, relation orchestra than any other orchestra, which is ironic because uh, Carnegie Hall is in New York and it's not the New York Philharmonic, but it's the Philadelphia Orchestra that has the, the, the longest and the tightest uh, relationship with. Um, in fact, uh, in 20, uh, last, uh, this year, 2020, Philadelphia Orchestra is the only orchestra to play in Carnegie Hall during the pandemic because the Carnegie Hall management uh, trusted the Philadelphia Orchestra's management, uh, probably more than any other orchestra, to manage this crisis together. Um, and uh, we, we'll talk a little bit about Philadelphia Orchestra maybe next week. Um, so it's interesting. Um, I, of course, I think you've, you've captured some of that attitude yeah. of, of the underdog. And when I lived in, uh, in mm. Tokyo, I, we had a really nice place in, you know, uh, near Arasagawa Park. And, and But my office was in Gotanda. And so Gotanda uh -huh. has a little bit of the same feel, right? It's like it's mm -hmm. kind of Kitanai kind of a place. It's not mm -hmm. first rate and nobody ever thinks and dreams of living in Gotanda. And hopefully nobody on this call is living in Gotanda. But it's, you know, <laughs> it's never really, you know, everybody kind of looks down on us, you know, the, those of us in, that were in Gotanda. I uh -huh. kind of liked it. I liked, I liked this yeah. office. The, the the sea urchin place that I would mm -hmm. go to was the best uni <laughs> I had anywhere in the world. And it was just right. like a... You know, it was just spectacular. So Philadelphia has a little bit of that same kind of Gotanda <laughs> sensibility, yeah, yeah. second city, never quite, you know, mm. never going to be the best or in terms of other people's perception. But to your point, mm. it's a great place to live. It's right between yeah. New York and Baltimore and Washington. Yeah. The train runs in between. It's just very, very convenient. So thank you for bringing yeah. us uh, all oh, of no, I, I just wanted to citizens. interject, interject real quickly, because as somebody who is from Chicago, which is also oh, my nicknamed, God. <laughs> nicknamed the second city. We can really relate to Philadelphia's blue collar culture. And there is a little bit of a complex, but of course we tell ourselves the story that, yeah, we're not as big as New York, but we're, we're high quality and we're down there. <laughs> Everybody's got their own self image. Anyway, so right. I just wanted to <laughs> no, no, that's, Yeah, but I do want to mention that, uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Doug. Thank you, Timothy. I, I want to mention that uh, Philadelphia has a youth orchestra called Philadelphia Youth Orchestra. And the United States has the, uh, United, uh, the youth orchestra of USA, which consists of the best orchestra players from the high school kids, right? And there are 50 states. And if you are, let's say, from Oregon, if you're selected, you are on the newspaper, right? Philadelphia Youth Orchestra sent seven, seven players into the National Youth Orchestra of the United States. And that is just amazing. So it is a great place to raise your, your kid. Um, so it depends on what you want. And depending on what you want, you can call it a first city or second city or even fifth city. In terms of population, Philadelphia is a sixth city. Uh, six uh, in terms of population, but um, I, I love this city. I, I live in this city for, for almost 30 years. Um, great people. Um, and then Japan Connection, which I will get into uh, if you allow me to. Um, and it sounds like there's no objection. I'm going to go right into it. Yeah, uh, please go. The, please go yeah thank you. The first person uh, is Nitobe Inazo, the 5,000 Japanese yen um, and, uh, previously, and he's a devoted Quaker. And he came to Philadelphia uh, and married a uh, Quaker friend's daughter uh, called Mary Sun. We call her Mary Sun in 1891. Uh, and he wrote this uh, famous Bushido book while he was in Philadelphia, which became, the, uh, I think, still one of the best selling, uh, best, best 
selling book uh, about it for Americans or Westerners to understand Japanese culture. Uh, obviously, Tom Cruise was one of the one of the big fans of of this book. And because he's a Quaker, he, I, I, you know, he went back to Japan and he uh, he wrote the life of um, William Penn. William Penn then in Japanese when he was in Sapporo teaching. I think he was uh, Hokkaido University, right? Um, so uh, I think Nitobe san saw the similarity between the Quakers' teaching and Bushido, Bushido or samurai's teaching. Uh, so he was on both sides, and uh, uh, the exact location where he lived in Philadelphia uh, is not is not published or public. But according to friends and friends teaching me where he actually lived, I put the location on this uh, link. Uh, on, on on this link, uh, you can only find his location, his uh, residence in Philadelphia, only in this URL that I put up there uh, on the Google map, and. Uh, of course, Mary san and, and uh, Nitobe san came back to Japan, and then uh, a few years later, they uh, they built, uh, they established, uh, they helped establish Tokyo Joshi Daigaku, Tokyo's Women's Christian University. Uh, I think his legacy uh, re continued to 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 affect uh, Japan and U.S. relationship. That's why he was on the five thousand yen um, mark. But interesting enough, the next person I'm going to mention is Tsuda Umeko. Uh, he was also, she was also in Philadelphia. He went to uh, Brimba College in Philadelphia, near, near Philadelphia. Uh, Brimba, Brimba College is a woman's college in one of the seven sisters. Uh, there are seven uh, women's colleges in the U.S. that are considered like Ivy League, right? Um, Brimba is one of them. And then Brimba College is also built or established by the Quakers. And after Nitobe Inazo, the person who appeared on the 5,000 yen is actually Tsuda Umeko. That's, I, that's Philadelphia connections here, right? One, one after another. Um, and she studied at the Brima College uh, and, uh, and then she, she was impressed by the way the American education educated women. And he, uh, she went, she went, so she went back to Japan and, and established a Tsuda University, Tsudajuku Daigaku. Um, and then Tsudajuku and Brima College are still sister cities, uh, sister uh, uh, colleges. They are uh, Shima, Shimai Ko uh, today. Um, and actually, I live near um, Brima College. It's a beautiful area to live at a very reasonable price, not like the price you have to uh, pay in the New York area. Um, and what I was going to say, yeah, the entire entire campus of Brima College is a is a, is a registered the National Register of Historic Place. Uh, it's considered one of the most beautiful campus in any universities in or colleges in the U.S. And by the way, I, I should mention here that the Philadelphia has more college students than any other cities in the U.S. So, so you have a lot of student activities, and that's fun. Uh, it's vibrant. Um, okay, mm -hmm. then the uh, person who also graduated from Brima College is Elizabeth Great Vining. Um, mm -hmm. She is also a Quaker. And she was the English teacher of Emperor Akihito uh, when he was still a crown prince. Mm -hmm. And the historians will tell you that uh, Miss Vining affected uh, Emperor Akihito philosophy, vision, and uh, many things, more than just English, a lot. And, and she's from Brima College, right? And after she left, a new English teacher came for another four years. Uh, her name is Esther Rose, and also also from Brima College. And so you have all these Quakers teaching uh, the emperor of Japan about Western culture, about English. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, naturally, there are a lot of speculations about what is the speciality between the Quakers and the emperor family. Um, uh, and nobody will be willing to tell you openly, but a lot of historic facts are there, which we're going to get into because things are going to get a little bit more exciting one after another. So we have to think about who uh, chose Miss Vining to be Akihito Emperor's uh, English teacher. Uh, his name is Bona Fellas. He came to Japan with General Douglas MacArthur um, when uh, many of the right hands of General MacArthur thought that the uh, uh, emperor uh, Hirohito is guilty of the war crimes after World War II, but uh, Bona Fela is the only one who defended uh, Emperor Hirohito. Uh, 
And this was captured in a, in a, in a movie called uh, Emperor in 2012. Some of you may have watched um, this uh, gentleman, a young American diplomat, um, tried to convince um, MacArthur not to prosecute um, Emperor Hirohito. Mm -hmm. But the movie didn't mention that he was also a Quaker. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you begin to think, you know, maybe Quakers are protectors of the imperial family. Is this a myth or is this true? Um, I'm, not go I'm not going to speculate here. I, I have no, I'm not qualified as a historian to tell you either way. You can decide by yourself, but I can show you a few many facts. Um, for example, um, you can follow the story of Kawaii Michi, mm. a lady. And she also went to Brimar College following uh, Umeko Tsuda's footsteps. She, uh, uh, along with uh, Yuri-san, uh, were the two Japanese who have been going to General MacArthur's office almost every day to try to explain to uh, Bona fellas about what role the Emperor Hirohito had played. And they were Quakers, the Japanese Quakers, if you will. They were they studying in you know, Brimo College. Mm -hmm. And uh, so put this into the, the entire context. Uh, you may be able to draw the conclusion by yourself. Mm -hmm. So all this, uh, what we Japanese call uh, Toshidensetsu, uh, if I can continue one more with another uh, Toshidensetsu, it's uh, Freemasons. The Masonic temple is right in front of the city hall, and that is a huge temple, and it's North America's headquarters, opened in 1873. And another Toshidensetsu, or the myth, uh, or maybe truth, is that the, the Freemasons and the American Revolution uh, uh, people, uh, especially George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, all these people in Philadelphia, they were also Freemasons, right? So they think the Freemasons in the American Revolution have something to do. But again, there's a debate about it. Um, but but, the, but the, the Masonic Temple in Philadelphia shouldn't be a surprise. In fact, the uh, cere ceremonial uh, gable that was used on the date by the uh, Freemasons um, chairman, they call it Grandmaster, um, it's the same uh, gable used by uh, George Washington when he um, started the uh, national capitals, nation's capital buildings in 1793. So you see a lot of similarities there. And of course, the Freemasons was the centerpiece of the movie in the movie National Treasure. And Freemasons also has an office in Japan, which is next to Tokyo Tower in Shinbashi, I think. So Freemasons, um, is big one. Freemasons and the Masons and the, the Quakers are the two major uh, influencers of the American hi history, I think, and they were both headquartered, or should I say, uh, head, yeah, headquartered in Philadelphia. Um, even though I would say, I would caution uh, our friends that is that the Freemasons is not, the Masons are not a religion. It's more like a gathering, a little bit like a Lottery Club or Lions Club kind of things. Um, with much uh, deeper in the history. Um, okay, uh, any questions so far? Um, any comment? My comment, Ren, is that uh, mm. I only wish we had the, um, that is the Oculus mm. technology now, so that we could, you know, have mm. that. And while listening to you, tell us uh, the stories and uh, about all these uh, historical sites in uh, Philadelphia, mm. so that uh, we could actually <laughs> immerse, you know, in the stories. <laughs> yes. To, yeah, and, and, and thank you. Uh, uh, the, the Masonic Temple was it's a private institution and it was used, used to be closed to public, but now it's open to public. So I would highly recommend going inside. Um, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> yes, it's so, interesting that there is, a, uh, you know, there is a house of the Masons here in Tokyo too. Yeah, yeah. I in, was in... not aware of that <laughs> just recently. Mm -hmm. and I became aware of that uh, uh, thanks to Timothy Langley, actually. So, mm. uh, he's not a Mason. <laughs> I, okay. he, he not, but, uh, he, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> but still, yes, it is fascinating to know how mm. uh, well we find uh, links between Japan and Philadelphia, even when we don't expect them to be. Right. Okay. Um, I think we are reaching an hour limit. Yeah, um, I wanted to get uh, say good morning to Yuka and mm -hmm. uh, invite her. She just came up on stage. Good morning. Thank you, Aran. Hello, Hello. Yuka. Mm -hmm. 
I just have to ask you, like, is there anything that you don't know? I mean, <laughs> uh, I am so does. embarrassed myself. He knows more about American history than me. I'm ashamed. <laughs> no, no, I just know a little bit about my hometown. I mean, I live in Philadelphia for 30 years. I gotta know something about my my town, right? That's, uh, that's yeah. all. So. Yes. I, I've lived in California for a while, but I don't know anything about California. And then, in fact, I, I, you know, I came up to the stage because I have to, because I went to the college, by the way. And I, oh, had, you did. No, I had no idea. Oh. Uh, they had a, like a, some sort of the, uh, uh, the relationship to the Quaker. And, I, you know, like a, because I probably, I have no idea about what the Quaker stands for. <laughs> So, but anyway, and now you know, I'm kind of intrigued and I'm going to study up on it. So, uh, yeah. thank you so much. Oh, uh, no, no, you're welcome. Uh, I, I'm not a Quaker. I'm not a, a Mason either. <laughs> but uh, I have many friends who are Quakers. It's an interesting, very interesting uh, uh, a tradition. I think they have different tradition. They don't have a, they don't have a priest. You know, if you go to their church, it's, a, it's like a round table. And people will close their eyes when they when a person felt God was talking to him or her, he can stand up and then preaching to the to the to the entire group. You don't have to be a priest, so it's really uh, interesting. Mm. They, they're kind of strict on their belief, right? That's my question. I, that, strictness mm. is a relative term. I'm, I'm sure they are more stricter uh, cri uh, Christianity. Uh, uh, how do you say "ha" in 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 English? I forgot. Uh, most, sec, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they are more most strict ones. Um, um, yeah. Anyway, so so did you say that you're gonna, you know, this? Did I? I thought you were gonna say you're gonna talk about juicy part of Japan, Japanese yeah. relationship. Did I yeah. miss that, or it's more? To no, come? no, no. <laughs> one more, one more to come, and I think you're gonna love it, uh, Yuka-san. I'm sure you're gonna love it. Okay, I, I love the like term it. juicy. <laughs> when you say juicy, I cannot miss it. I thought. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, so here, here, here's the last part, and I know we are pushing over a bit, uh, an hour now. I uh, thank you for giving me the time, um, Maya and Timothy, everyone. The, the climax of this discussion should be the Navy Yard, is what I thought, so I left this uh, towards the end. The, the Philadelphia once had, well, we still have something called Navy Yard. Na what, what is Navy Yard? Navy Yard is the, 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 the battleship building uh, uh, area, just like uh, uh, Zou Senjo in Nagasaki, you know, Mitsubishi, you know, things like that. Um, so. Uh, in fact, uh, Hisa, uh, Hisaya Iwasaki, the third uh, generation of the Mitsubishi uh, family, uh, he came to Philadelphia, uh, studied at Wharton uh, Business School for five years from 1888. Uh, but I'm sure he also went to Navy Yard to learn how to build ships, uh, which made Mitsubishi the, 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 the powerhouse of the shipbuilding company in Japan. But here's an interesting connection with Japan besides uh, Mitsubishi family. Uh, as you know, uh, Japan had a, had a war with Russia, the Japanese-Russian war. And during, uh, before that, um, Japan and Russia ordered ships or battleship. In this case, it's more of a, a protected cruisers to be built in Philadelphia. The Russian uh, cruiser's name is called Vadiag, which is the Russian word of Vikings, I believe. And it was, uh, it, it was sent to the sea, it was launched, uh, it, it went into service in 1899. And Japan asked Philadelphia to build uh, the cruiser uh, Kasagi, um, which is also similar spec, similar size of the ship. Uh, in 1898, only one year earlier than Vadiag, to be to be launched to be used, and then these two ships were fighting in Japan Sea during the Japanese Russian War. Can you believe this? Two ships from the same Philadelphia Navy Yard were fighting each other in Japan Sea, oh, wow. and the Variag was was sunk um, by the Japanese battleships, and it went to the bottom of the ocean. And it was only recently lifted, uh, I think 2003 or 2004, and uh, they were surprised that these American-made metals are still intact uh, in the bottom of the ocean. Um, so here's an interesting uh, historic fact, and again, it's up to you how you're going to judge this. Uh, there is a young engineer graduated from 
University of Tokyo. His name was uh, 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 Masumoto-san, Masumoto. He was only about 26 or 27 years old. He was hired at the Navy Yard to join the design of the Variag. Can you believe this? A Japanese engineer who understood every detail about the design that went into the Variag. Mm. And uh, a Japanese gentleman, an officer, a Navy officer called Akiyama, even went to see this young engineer in Philadelphia Navy Yard several times. And this Akiyama, uh, the Japanese Navy officer, was a good friend of uh, Komura, uh, the, then the Japanese ambassador to the US. And Komura was the person who sent Masumoto to work in the Navy Yard. And then the war broke out. But when the war broke out, the J Japan knew everything about that ship. And in fact, there were some rumors that the Masumoto intentionally introduced some bugs into the Russian cruiser. So when Russia trying to fire the uh, uh, missiles, the right word, uh, Taiho, um, to fire something, it didn't fire. <laughs> so there were a lot of bugs in that uh, in that things. And uh, uh, so if you are into some, you know, Double Seven James Bond movie kind of things, you can check more into these uh, historic facts. And I put some links there, and you can see the behind the scene of how Japan won that war with Russia. Because when Japan won that war, uh, it was a surprise, you know, I think uh, a little country in the Far East, how could they beat Russia? Uh, there are a lot of things that were, there were a lot of moving parts behind the scene. And one of the uh, centerpiece of that scene uh, was, uh, uh, was started in Philadelphia. So uh, that is another historical information that may be interesting to you. Uh, and Navy Yard right now is no longer building Navy and uh, building battleships. Uh, it has transformed itself to be the most green business center, uh, one of the most green business centers in the US. Uh, you have to uh, meet certain criteria to be able to have an office or buildings built in Navy Yard location. And uh, a UK pharmaceutical company had, uh, called Galaxo Smith Klein, uh, which had a headquarter, uh, I think, in uh, North Carolina. I think they moved to Philadelphia. And also an uh, apparel company called Urban Outfitter. Uh, they also moved their headquarters from New York to Philly because they fell in love with Navy Yard. It's just beautiful, all buildings. And their cafeteria uh, is open to public. So if you come to Philadelphia, you can go to go to their cafeteria and then see how uh, what uh, uh, what uh, how people in the U.S. who are involved in fashion design industry what they wear to go to work. And my friend, uh, who is a consultant, and uh, he's. Uh, he invites uh, some of the Chinese investments into the U.S. He said when he took these Chinese businessmen into the Urban Outfitters cafeteria, uh, these Chinese businessmen, businessmen said, uh, this is the place I saw more beautiful American woman than any other places. But anyway, I don't know what these Chinese businessmen were looking at, but uh, it is a beautiful place and a beautiful people, not just uh, not just ladies, but men as well. Uh, they're well dressed and uh, it's uh, the cafeteria is is in the old shipyard building, and so it's a historic, historic building by itself. And worth a visit. It's difficult to find, but I put the lo exact location on the, on the Google map in this link as well. So that's the story about uh, the story about Navy Yard. Um, any of the things that I said uh, interested you that you'd like to ask more uh, before we closing this down, uh, Maya? Uh, uh, the only thing I want to do is go to Philadelphia right now. And mm. have ah, okay. as my tour guide, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I would be more than happy to be your tour guide. There are, there are so many things that I have I was not able to cover, including including you know um, Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, you know the Japanese. Uh, uh, it's a mystery uh, writer. Mm -hmm. uh, in Japan, we have uh, someone someone called Edogawa Lampo. Uh, he was uh, his real name is uh, Hirai Taro. Mm -hmm. uh, his pen name is rendering of. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, <laughs> uh, because Rampo, because Edogawa san was an admirer of him, Edgar, uh, Edgar Allan Poe. I know I, I, my pronunciation may be confusing you. One person is Ed, the real Edgar Allan Poe, <laughs> and uh, Edogawa Rampo is a Japanese. <laughs> uh, and then of course, Ed, Edgar uh, Allan Poe's uh, one of the most famous uh, uh, composition is uh, Raven. Um, and uh, Raven, if you go to the National Historic Site of Edgar Allan Poe's house, you can see that you can feel the raven, just like the mystery book, the story that he created, or poems, should I say. 
And uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra, I think we're going to leave that for the next week. Uh, Philadelphia Orchestra, of course, is one of the greatest orchestras in the world, uh, but it is still a community orchestra, and it is an interesting blend, and how it got to where it is today, starting with, as an amateur orchestra, became a local orchestra, became a world-class orchestra, um, and, and that has a lot to do with the nature or the culture or the spirits of this uh, city. Uh, and we can leave that for the next week. And that will be the um, end of this. Oh, before I, I, before I close that down, I just want to mention that the current music director of the Philadelphia Orchestra is uh, Montreal born maestro called Yannick Neves Segan. It's a difficult, but, uh, difficult French name to pronounce, but uh, he has a lot of charms. Um, and of course, the Philadelphia Orchestra and then Rachmaninoff have a lot in common. Rachmaninoff, when he first heard the Philadelphia Orchestra sound, he thought this is the, this is the sound he was looking for. This is the best orchestra sound he has ever heard. So since after that, all the uh, compositions that Rachmaninoff composed, uh, he imagined how it would sound by the Philadelphia Orchestra when he composed. And this is well uh, documented in the Carnegie Hall um, video, uh, about five minutes short video uh, spoken by the Carnegie Hall archive director. And that is that link is also um, posted there uh, for your for your pleasure. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that was wonderful. Yes, it was really wonderful. It was informative. And there are so many stories which, uh, well, I, I really love hearing from you. Thank you for that. And uh, so if uh, there are any questions or comments, please let us know. Come up on stage now. Yes. Um, yes, Yuka. I'm sorry, you know, I, 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 I said, you know, if there is more juicy stuff, and I'm sorry, that was rude of me. Everything you said, Ren, was juicy. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Yuka. Lara, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, Ren. That was so amazing. Thank you so much. That was a really um, exquisite uh, view of Philadelphia. I'm a UPenn Wharton alumni, so I... I oh! <laughs> <laughs> and I All didn't right. Back, you know, I did back since for reunions, and I, I remember the Wanaka, uh, Wanaka uh, pipe organ. so gorgeous. Like, I remember once where I was back, back in town for a reunion, I was going to an evening event, so I came late rushing into the department store. I think it's called it's Macy's now, but it's still a mm. beautiful building. And I remember mm. the organ playing, and I'm like, oh my god, this is a dream. It's really absolutely something. something. I hope it hasn't shut, you know, all department stores are shutting down. I hope it doesn't shut down. It's, it's yeah, they're still, yeah, they're still doing well. I mean, where else can you go to do shopping and listening to the pipe organs at the same time, right? It's kind of a, a, a interesting experience. Yeah. Definitely. And I wanted to add a little bit more juicy stuff. So I think the juicy <laughs> stuff is still going on in Philadelphia in terms of the, the, the Navy Yard because the uh, United, uh, the, the Navy still has the, an intelligence, I think a strategic center. I forget what they call it exactly. I mean, just, I just looked mm. it up actually, the name of it. It's, um, it's called oh my god anyway i can't find it right now but um um it uh, so they have they conduct their center there conducts all hmm. the strategic um technical military operations for yeah. um research and development <laughs> and right. i met people there working there and it's pretty like 007 stuff like they do do like mm -hmm. state-of-the-art unmanned uh v, you know un unmanned vehicles for the for the ocean and they do a lot of um what do you call some marine stuff like latest in the art so it's, it's just right. double stuff. yeah right. yeah do you remember the movie called philadelphia experiment that's uh <laughs> That's also pretty amazing moving, uh, movie. And, and by the way, uh, Lara, to your point, um, a little bit the north of Philadelphia, uh, that's the, that's, uh, if you're driving on the highway, I think you know this, but uh, for, for the audience, you're going to see a building that is huge, that looks like a ship, <laughs> that building shape looks like a ship. Uh, that's where Lockheed Martin is doing a lot of uh, research on Aegis um, oh. a battleship, uh, especially the radar. Um, so when the first time I went to Philadelphia, the reason I came to Philadelphia was because uh, Panasonic built a, a high definition television laboratory in in this area, and I was uh, I was sent there in 1993, and we had to hire some local engineers, um, developers, uh, chip designers, and we hire a few from the Lockheed Martin, the uh, uh, that Navy uh, research uh, lab that was doing the Aegis. Oh my God, these engineers are so top notch. I mean. Whatever we are doing for consumer electronics or like child play for them. <laughs> um, so uh, I just want to mention the vast amount of talented uh, uh, people, uh, engineers, scientists in, the, in Philadelphia, which shouldn't be a surprise to someone like Lara, who is in UPenn. I'm sure you, you saw me, he is smart people in, in, in UPenn. So, um, but anyway, Lara, that was the, I think there were a lot of uh, military stuff going on around uh, Philadelphia, including Navy Yard. Um, it is a beautiful campus. Oh, by the way, uh, Lara, in case you didn't know this, uh, Navy Yard, 
has all the buildings from the 18th century, 19th century, or 20th century. So when the when President Obama wanted to have a smart building uh, project, uh, which includes not just high rise but also condominium, but also factories, all the buildings uh, from all the uh, different eras, uh, the Navy Yard became the uh, convenient place because they could. Uh, test uh, in IoT, Internet of Things, all these uh, uh, sensor technologies to see how energy can, consumption can be lowered with older buildings and uh, retrofitting with the latest technologies. So uh, Navy Yard has that, uh, is playing that role as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I just, I looked at, sorry, it's, it's called the Naval Surface Warfare Center. It's a very unassuming name, but they do a lot of stuff. So definitely, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, well, that's fascinating listening to, to all of you. Um, well, I really, I hope that the borders were open, but maybe very soon, hopefully, in, uh, yeah, next yeah. year. And, and, and seriously, if you ever come to Philadelphia, please be your guide. Yeah, I like to take you around. I like to take Timothy around. I like to take anybody around. Uh, Yuka, you too. Uh, maybe, maybe Yuka, we, we can take you to eat uh, Philly's cheesesteak. It's very juicy. <laughs> That's okay. Good. All right. It's going to be a big lineup, Ren, for you. <laughs> yes, and then you might well, you know, end up um, well setting up a company, you know, for uh, let's say tour guiding or guiding company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. yeah, when I retire. Well, I will never retire, but yeah, yes. as a hobby. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but we love your storytelling and uh, your stories and everything uh, you talk about is amazing. So thank you very much indeed. Ren, have a great day and see you next time again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye -bye. thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ren. Bye. See you next week. See you. Thank you for coming and staying with us today. We will be on air next week on Thursday at 8 a.m. Japan time again. So join us. Until then, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the conversations on Japanese politics, business insights, and the role of Japan in the Indo-Pacific region. If you want to stay informed about our upcoming events, you can follow us on Clubhouse, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Again, we're looking forward to your joining us next week. Until then, stay well and make the best of the day. See you.